most of you will know our guest this evening as I guess one of the most prominent thorns in the British government side for the past few few years, almost a decade. I'm thinking, Joe, um, and he's a King's Counsel, so he's achieved the highest possible professional recognition as a barrister, and really taken numerous battles of against Goliath. Um, sort of goliaths in in this world and particularly on in the british isles um he's recently brought out his fourth book uh bringing down goliath which takes us from his beginnings through uh, sort of the workings of the legal and the political systems in the uk and the stories of some of these cases that have made him really well known as well as other juicy stories i would say because it is worth going and buying the book you think you know i thought i knew lots of the stories and actually, I learned a ton um, about the system and how it operates and how it operates. Look, you can feel my my usual notes. Um, and if you're not living in the UK, I think there's so many interesting themes that are completely universal. So so just a warning, we're not going to um, tell you everything that's in the book because you need to go and buy it. Um, but we will discuss some of those things and some of the the themes and, and any questions you have. Uh before we go further, I guess I just need to declare an interest. So I've been a supporter of the Good Law Project for quite a long time. And um, I heard about it because my friend Rupert Evans, who hopefully is on the call, um, sort of helped, get, who helped get it started and is mentioned in the book. And back in 2019, I think, we tried to get uh, Joe to speak at the Volans Tomorrow's Capitalism Forum, where I know some of you were, but the logistics at that time didn't work out. So... I'm really excited we're going to do this and I'm declaring my bias up front. So if I'm too nice and not provocative enough, I'm expecting all of you to put strong, interesting questions in the chat as always. That's my spiel. Joe, welcome. Um, it's brilliant to have you here. Thank you for taking the time in your shorts. A, a, a total, a total pleasure. Um, yeah, I, I like the organisation very much, and I was really sorry to miss that event back in 2019 as as well. And I'm really excited to be talking to all of your your book club. Yes, and um, as I told you, there's lots of people here that we will we can introduce when 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 needed. But yeah, from all different walks of life and from a few different continents, probably. Um, I um. I normally start with, you know, what's the book about? But I actually thought if if we can, I wanted to start somewhere slightly different because uh, I learned, you know, about you personally also from from reading the book and sort of from being um, in your upbringing, a homeless teenager in New Zealand to sort of splitting this life in the UK between privilege in West London, um, close to where I live in the suburbs and working class life in Northeast of England before you even started university and then going from tax lawyer to campaigner and and then through the book I feel like there's this theme about the importance of seeing the world through different lenses um, and that your tribe and I'm going to assume that a lot of people on this call are your tribe aren't really um, necessarily trained to do that um, and it's something that's really key how how, how we think at Volans too, this idea of how do you look at different systems and put yourself in, in other people's shoes. And so it made me think of a question that John, um, Volans founder, who's also in the call. Yes. Hi, John. From his studio at home, I think. Um, uh, he often asks, especially when we interview potential clients to see if we want to work with them, he asks this question. So um, what kind of mutant are you, Joe? What, how would you describe that kind of mutancy again in the best possible definition of the word mutant? Um, it's a really, really good place to start actually um, because um, the journey uh, I think to where I now am um, uh, from sort of lawyer to campaigner um, has also run in parallel with uh, a sort of personal and and in a way more important, at least more important to me journey from um, complacent to a place of 
greater understanding. Um, and I, I mean, I'll try and tell the story really frankly, because if I don't tell it frankly, um, it won't be true. Um, so uh, I did, as Louise has said, come from a very difficult background. Um, I was kicked out by um, my parents when I was, I can't remember whether I was 15 or 16, um, without any money, still at school. I supported myself cleaning um, the toilets at the local girls' school. I still didn't really have enough money to pay the the rent, and I ended up living with two much older men, both of whom had um, not wholly platonic designs on me. Um, uh, uh, so I once knew what it was to be an outsider, but, um, you know, you go to university. Uh, you, I worked at the BBC for a couple of years. I went to university. You become a lawyer. Um, you become a King's Counsel. And during the course of that process, um, you become an insider again. And I think I'd forgotten um, much of what was once very dear to me. Um, that the life that you experience as an insider is very different to the life that people who are not insiders experience. Um, uh, and your expectation as an insider that um, institutions will remember that it's their job to look after people like you, that um, although things go wrong, if you push, um, you can cause them to be right, that you'll be sort of fairly represented in the media um, that your voice will be heard. Um, uh, that 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 understanding, which is sort of inherent to every element of your existence, um, and is very true for you, is not true um, for lots and lots of people, um, people who are outsiders. And I think um, really it was the work, perhaps the most controversial work Good Law Project's done bizarrely, the work that we've done with the trans community um, that um, that taught me that, that reminded me that the world that had become my own was not um, the world as it existed for everyone. And so in the book, um, I talk about that work as being a skeleton key to a whole new moral universe. Um, because that um, knowledge born of deep experience Experience that institutions and the media um, are fair and look after you is very easy to take into your conceptions of um, the validity of other people's complaints um, and to cause you to ignore how their lives are different and to misdiagnose how they're treated and to misunderstand um, uh, fairness and unfairness as it affects people who are not as privileged as 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 I am. And there is something actually that is um universal, and this is the point about it being a skeleton key to a whole new moral universe. There's something that's universal actually about that experience of outsiders. And and um and I tell the story in the book about um uh, uh, a friend wanting to take me on a Black Trans Lives Matters march in Brighton and me thinking, all right, it's Brighton, so there'll be a big LGBT um, plus community, um, but it's Brighton, so there are not that many Black people, so it's going to be a tiny, tiny march. And what I saw when I went there was that, um, you know, a huge proportion of Brighton's Black population was on the march and a huge proportion of... Um, uh, Brighton's LGBTQ plus community was on that march as well. So um, it wasn't the intersection between those communities that was on that march. It was both of those communities. It was both of those circles together because both understood um, the universality of being outside. Um, and um, and I think that that's probably... The, the mutant that I am. I'm half uh, in and half out, half human, half alien um, uh, in both the, um, if there is a biological sense of the word alien uh, and, and the metaphorical sense of that word as well. Thank you. No, that um, really interesting. How do you, I guess, 
to, to those of us who feel slightly inside outside um it seems really important and one of the things you know and i know that through our team partly because of john um i think most of our team members have have some of that and um and i guess how how do we teach more people to 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 do that if you if you are an insider do you have any sort of um tips and tricks for getting people up that learning curve faster than you know pushing them outside <laughs> so to speak yeah um i think there is no I mean, if our experience of, of um, the media is that it's fair, um, and it is for insiders, their experience of the media, um, it's very difficult to learn what life is like for others mm -hmm. um, secondhand through um, mediated accounts of, of their lives. Um, but I'm a huge optimist about um, people and their decency and their humanity and in my experience um, direct contact with people who are not like us um, causes us to have the ability to see the world through through their eyes mm. um, and I'm not sure there is a a good substitute actually for that unmediated exposure to other people's lives um, I mean, for my own part, um, causing people to be um, questioning, as it were, about um, the extent to which their own experiences are representative is one of the really important exercises um, that the book does. And in um, Good Law Project has sort of three strands of work. It has an environmental strand. It has um, a governance strand, and it also has a sort of um, uh, minoritized uh, communities strand. And although that's in some ways quite odd, um, in other ways it's quite powerful because it enables us to cross sell messages. So people who come to us because they're interested in the work that we did with the New York Times, um, exposing how uh, Guardian News and media had failed to take seriously um, allegations of sexual assault. Um, against, in fact, it was a number of um, staff members at, 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 at GNM. People who come to our work for that, we can then expose to, to environmentalism. People who come to our, um, come to us because of the work we did in, in Brexit, uh, we can talk about um, trans rights too. So you're always speaking to people outside of the choir you're preaching to the people you know who you need to persuade rather than the people who you who, who are yet to um rather than the people who are already persuaded um and that exercise actually of um translating or i think a better way of putting it actually is sort of laundering the experiences of others to make them palatable to those um you need to persuade is one of the skill sets that I do think that I that I that I have, and I think is 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 really important. I mean, the truth is, um, everyone, almost everyone, I imagine on this call, will listen to me talking about, um, you know, the experience of um, uh, communities that they don't know. And will listen much more attentively and much more receptively than they will um, if confronted randomly by by content directly from those communities. And so, um, sorry, it's a very long answer. No, no, no. Um, but you know, within Good Law Project, we have this ongoing debate between um, what our young members of staff say, which is that we ought to be platforming um, minoritized communities, um, and uh, the other school of thought, which is that actually platforming minoritized communities um, obviously gives them a voice. But if, if if the people you need to persuade won't listen, then then actually doing advocacy for them instead of platforming them is is important. And that's a an odd and a difficult message actually internally to sell, and it's an ugly thing to say externally. But I think it's true. I think that role of 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 um, translating or, or or laundering 
content yeah. so that it's palatable to people that you need to persuade is very important and something that I think That's... has much value in what I try to do. Yeah, no, it's really, really interesting. It's, it it's, has parallels to some of what we do. Uh, we say that we've got to be be pre, sort of palatable to CEOs who we are trying to help transform, but also provocative enough that we're moving them somewhere else. We don't necessarily have, you know, we are platforming or not platforming people um, in the same way you potentially could. But, um, but it is that there are two different roles i think one is platforming and one is translating and bridging and sort of controlling across um yeah that's right i mean you know businesses often talk about going to where their customers are um and that might be true as a as a description of um how you sell product but it's also true of um how you sell ideas you need to um sit on the sort of intellectual or emotional shoulder uh, of somebody like, and just like pull saying. them towards okay. you, um, persuade them gently over time. Um, and if, uh, as I am, you're inherently optimistic about human nature, um, that's a tactic that might feel uncomfortable to those who are um, more radical, but nevertheless is, I think, your best prospect of succeeding. Right. I want to come back to the optimism and human nature a little bit later, but I just let's um, you started a brilliant segue into, you know, the, the good law project and the three types of work you do. So environmentalism, governance um, and, and minorities. The the other three sort of themes I, I noted was sort of this idea of holding power to account, making sure nobody's left behind. Well, I guess that's it. That's a minority piece. How did you set out with those three? Um, did you just start where you were with the Brexit problem or question? And we don't have to go into, you know, being Danish, I can get quite emotional around Brexit, but uh, so I'm not saying we should dive deep, deep into that. But how, how did yeah. that, did it just evolve? Well, I mean, I'm not inviting anyone to do this. Um, but if you look at goodlawproject.org on the Wayback Machine, you'll find the first version of our website that we put up in 2017. Um, Rupert Evans, uh, as I say in the book, gave us 10,000, gave me 10,000 pounds with no strings attached. I was very, very, very reluctant to take his money at the time. I was a um, high earning tax lawyer. Um, 10,000 pounds wasn't a hugely significant amount of money. And I was keenly aware of all of the sort of moral obligations that it would impose upon me to make very good use of that money in ways that I wouldn't have felt if it was my own money I was spending. But eventually he persuaded me and I used that money to throw up a website. I engaged three interns and and uh, uh, and over the couple of course of a couple of months, we we put up a website and fundamentally um the idea um that's central to that site and it's not especially good but the idea that is central is um that there are big communities to whom power doesn't talk of course in 2017 we were in the aftermath of brexit and it, uh, the, the brexit referendum at any rate um jeremy corbyn um wasn't keen on remaining the conservative party was very keen on on leaving and so you know a, a proportion of the population something like 50 percent wasn't being addressed by either of the main political parties wasn't really being represented in the media um and it seemed um uh as though there were wide open spaces that the law um might begin to address and in a funny sort of way that's a sort of good answer to your 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 other question as well what is it like to be an outsider to be misrepresented constantly in the media um uh, and in our institutions those on this call who voted remain and thought and think that that would have been much better for the country can cast their mind back um to those years and uh, and we'll get some understanding of what it's like to be um, misrepresented in the media. When eventually we left, I gave an interview to the Financial Times in which I said that actually probably the one good thing to come out of Brexit was, was that it might have 
radicalized a whole generation of people who were previously politically complacent they will remember that that experience i have two or three friends who as a direct consequence have gone into politics at different levels because they felt so underrepresented and really sort of were galvanized in that direction i think it 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 still feels to me like one of the big wins i guess for the for the leave campaign that it seemed that it was just this stupid minority of Guardian readers who had voted Remain, and 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 the political party seemed to still be convinced of that somehow, and, and not really leaning in particularly heavily um, into to that group of us. Maybe, um, or maybe the truth is that what we read in the newspapers is a very curated version a very particular um telling um of 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 the truth Mm. um and that we ought always um and in particular when we're reading in the media stories that are convenient to um prevailing political power we ought always to be much much more skeptical than than we are and of course, outsiders have always known that to be true. Um, and those of us who want to cling on, who, who think it's important that we be sentient about um, uh, how we're manipulated, not just on social media, but also in the traditional media, might um, hang on and keep burning um, those fires of memory from the the Brexit years where we did see how the truth was curated in ways that made it feel uh, a long way from 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 actual reality. No, um, yeah, I think you're right. Just jumping to the book for a second because um, the, so a good chunk of the book, sort of is dedicated really to describing in detail some of the workings of the legal, the judicial, the political system, the media. Um, do you feel like most people don't really know how the system works? And is that why you wrote it? Um, I suppose I became... I mean, it's a difficult book to sell and a difficult book to commission because I knew I wanted to write a book and I didn't quite know what the book was going to be and I also knew that I wouldn't know what the book was going to be until substantially I made significant progress in (laughs) writing it um but as I was writing it I became more and more interested in what um uh Marxists I suppose would call the sort of hegemonic quality of the law um in the sense of um the fact that um the law has Um, a series of stories that it tells about itself uh, and what it does, that it gatekeeps um, furiously and lawyers being very good at arguing um, effectively. And the stories that it tells about itself are stories about the law's ability ethically to sort of to level up and the law's inherent fairness um and you know we see lady justice on top of the old bailey with her blindfold and her um scales um and we see judges promising to act without fear or favor and there are very very few books and i'm not aware of any in the mainstream that interrogate really whether those stories that the law tells about itself are are true um, and the more I began to think about it, um, the more I began to realise that, in fact, and again, to quote another line from the book, um, the law is the the victory dance of power. So, you know, the law is the articulation of the policy preferences of governments over time. So for the law to... Um, or for something to be the law, it has to have represented the policy preferences uh, of a government, um, so of power at a particular moment in in, in time. Um, and then, so, so that's true as a matter of um, 
what the law is. And it's also true at a sort of, not a substantive level, but at a procedural level. Um, it's all very well and good, the law offering safeguards to people who are unable to afford lawyers. But if um, those safeguards are inaccessible, um, if they're only available indeed to those who have money, the law becomes a sort of a weapon that only the wealthy can pick up. And, and so it's used um, to further the interests uh, of, of that sort of social class um, rather, than, um, rather than in the interests of, of, of fairness. And we don't talk about that stuff much. No. Really interesting, and I love the the you say that the sort of the heart of the Good Law Project, in a sense, is that access and that equal access, which it's very clear as you're describing through through the book, isn't there. And I guess some of us, is, you know, you might suspect it, but you don't really know. So a, a couple of things on that. So um, could you also talk a little bit about um the how law is taught and and there's lack of humanity really in that. Um, I'd be really interested. How would you teach law differently if you know the next generation? So my sixteen-year-old is seriously considering she would like to be a lawyer. Um, you know, how would you go about that if 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 you had the clean slate almost, not the new system, but but how we teach it? I think that's really interesting. Yeah, and and this is actually a very live debate at the moment. So the chair of the bar council in England is a guy called Nick Finial, I think. Um, and he, in our domestic press, is very cross with the International Bar Association. The International Bar Association is saying um, that lawyers need to act in ways that are more cognizant um, of law's place as um, a servant to the public interest. Um, the ways in which um, lawyers are trained in the UK represent a particular conception of a lawyer as fundamentally a, a kind of a mercenary for hire. So somebody who you can pay to advance your interests, who has, who has overarching interests not to mislead the court, but those are very, very narrow interests or a very narrow constraint on um, on the lawyer's duty to their client. Um, and that there's not much um, that you cannot do to advance the interests of your client. Um, uh, yeah, you give a great you example of that in the book, don't you? You talk about um, a lawyer sort of creating a contract that binds a victim of sexual assault to not speak out because they get paid or something like that. Well, that's right. right. That... So, I mean, there are lots and lots of examples. So I talk about um, non-disclosure agreements um, mm. that are hoisted upon um, usually women, usually in consequence of them being subjected to, to sexual violence by, by their bosses. Uh, and that's a theme that Good Law Project works on quite a lot. Um, in the Times a few years ago, I wrote about a habit that some big businesses, uh, including a joint venture of which one of the partners was Mercedes-Benz, um, had acquired of um, putting into contracts with um, workers clauses that were unenforceable, um, just unenforceable in law. But they put those clauses in, not because they were mistaken about their enforceability. They put those clauses in in an attempt to mislead mm. workers um, as to the legal rights that they had. So they were deliberately trying to undermine the will of Parliament. Um, and, um, and of course, um, you know, if you're a worker and you don't have a lawyer, you're not going to know that those clauses are unenforceable. And so you might think that they do actually represent um, your employer's um, entitlement, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis you. Um, so the real problem actually is this conception of us as, as, as guns for hire, as sort of mercenaries, owing a duty only to our clients 
Um, and we received no sort of ethical training on the place that law has in the broader world um, on our obligations to, to broader society. And I give in the book a couple of examples. So um, I talk about the debate um, that the tax profession had um, back in around 2014, 15, 16, when I began to transition actually away from uh, from practice uh, about tax avoidance. So this was in the aftermath of the financial crisis, um, and uh, you know the the sort of cupboard of public finances was relatively bare, uh, and there were all these huge tax avoidance schemes. And Margaret Hodge, when she was chair of the Public Accounts Committee, was talking about this a lot and making a lot of noise, uh, and the media was very interested. And the tax profession thought this was ludicrous could not understand um, how these structures, which made perfect sense to the profession, um, were being vilified, could not see um, any ethical component to the practice of their, their work. And I see that, I then talk about a sort of a more recent and ongoing problem, actually, that the criminal um, bar has with gatekeeping how we um, treat victims of rape. So um, I, I bet every woman on this call has got a, a sort of a list of um, atrocities that she's been subject to um, uh, by men um, during the course of um, her, her life. Few of those will have been reported to the police um, uh, statistically, um, you know, if there are five women um, on this call, one of them will have been raped. Um, uh, but you'd need um, 500 uh, uh, women on this call before one of those rapes would have led to a, a, a conviction. Conviction rates are painfully low. Um, but the criminal justice system doesn't think there's anything wrong with this. It doesn't ask itself the question whether the law is right. It doesn't ask itself the question whether a law that fails to deter men from raping um, is a law that serves broader society. It, it asks itself a much more inward-facing question, which is, is this conduct that is being castigated in the media consistent or not consistent with the law? rather than the question I argue it should consider, which is, is it consistent? Is the law consistent or inconsistent with the interests of broader society? Um, and uh, rape campaigners like Vera Baird, who was Victims Commissioner, Harriet Harman, who most of you will know, who was briefly leader of the Labour Party, uh, now um, so-called mother of the house, um, when they tried to talk about the failings of the criminal justice system, were really um, uh, dragged, I think the young people would say, um, were hammered on social media by the criminal uh, by the criminal bar um, for 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 that advocacy. So, um, so I think I think we need to listen to what the International Bar Association is saying rather than the Bar Council. And lawyers need to be trained um, to understand that the law is um, a servant of the public interest, not its master. Yeah, it's really interesting. As you're talking, it, it it seems that there are some parallels of of um, sort of the business community, in a sense, going from um, shareholder primacy and, and only thinking about what investors' um, interests are when they're running a business to this idea of broadening the stakeholders and saying, well, what impact does the, the company have in the world? And, and, of course, there's no solution to that yet. It's still <laughs> shareholder primacy um most of the way but but it feels similar that we're at points where systems that we've been happy with or, or have accepted need to change and they need to find their place in the world in a, in a slightly different way yeah we're running out of road aren't we um uh and of course the uh, the most obvious place where we're running out of road is is on um climate change but that's not the only example of where it feels like capitalism in its present conception is sort of um, nearing the end of its sustainable course. Um, 
uh, globalization is causing enormous problems in mature democracies that can't any longer rely on sort of ever increasing standards of of living and so that sort of per, um, post-war compact is beginning to collapse and that's driving um, political populism. Um, monopoly power means that um, uh, big global corporations sometimes feel and sometimes act as though they feel that they have more power than nation states. I don't know if any of you heard the extraordinary interview that um, a senior executive at Microsoft gave um, when the UK's Competition and Markets Authority blocked the proposed merger with Activision. Um, sounds like an odd thing for yeah, no. me to recommend that you go away and find and listen to, but it's pretty extraordinary. It it it, it really does reflect um, his belief um, that uh, a small or at least a medium-sized country like the United Kingdom has no place blocking uh, yeah. a merger from a global corporation like like Microsoft and you know of course governments have very little room to move politically um and global corporations are not um uh you know have, have, have much more freedom um to act and not required to sort of triangulate as governments do um I don't think that's unusual um, my experience of specifically American tech companies sort of that is has been their their opinion and attitude for for quite a while, right? That that they know what they're doing, and actually, there's no place for for nation states to to come up against them, which is why they get so shocked when, especially the EU, um, have come down quite hard on a few things. Um, but that and it's is really their conception, and it's also true um, that they are bigger have more room for manoeuvre, um, are less beholden to um, uh, an electorate, are less scrutinised, um, and so are and so are much more much more powerful. Have much more. I mean, power expressed as, I suppose, um, agency and and freedom to to to, to push their their agenda. Mm. Um, and anyway, so we can... we're drifting quite a long way from my expertise and indeed from the yeah, book. I was but gonna say, no, no, um, interesting things. hopefully still interesting. And you give lots of, so if we go to that sort of systems question, because you give lots of examples of the political climate causing institutions not to do the job we expect of them, whether that's the electoral committee failing to investigate the vote leave campaign or sort of judges. I think there's a, you mentioned a couple of times sort of, senior judges saying let's keep our powder dry in case there's a major issue with this government um like the proroguing or um and we, so so there's, there's clearly a faulty system in many in, in in many ways if i could be a little bit provocative because you're still um mainly using that proverbial slingshot to to have a go at goliath is it without a reform of the system are you playing a really brilliant sort of um, important version of whack-a-mole and, and, and sort of trying to hit those pieces? When do we get to the point that you're going to break the system instead? Yeah, well, um, uh, I mean, the book is very clear that power uh, lies and should lie with the, uh, um, the demos, the people um not with um the judges and it's also very clear that um um in a country like the united kingdom which doesn't have a higher law which doesn't have a, a sort of constitution um what can be achieved through the law alone um is is pretty modest um we can't strike down acts of primary legislation. So the government's um, bills clamping down on protest break all sorts of international yes. uh, human rights norms. Ditto uh, legislation that's proposed on immigration breaks all sorts of international law norms. The book quotes a very good line um, from a government advisor drawn from Politico in which she says, and. Um, for, 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 for forgive the, the, the swear, but he says we're 
um, fucking breaking international law like it's one of our five a day. Um, but judges can't do anything about that. Um, but what litigation can do is give um, people a sense of agency. Here is a way in which I can tackle this problem. Um, it can cause, it can give journalists new ways to write about familiar themes. So it's very, very painful if you're a, uh, a journalist writing about the environment and you care about what's happening to the environment um, to have to write about, um, you know, for example, this morning, the um, Committee on Climate Change report that says that there's sort of massive backsliding in, 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 in the UK. Um, we're failing on virtually every measure. How do you write about that story in a way that doesn't just cause people to switch off? We want them to switch on, not to switch off. Um, mm -hmm. We need to fill people with sort of hope rather than with despair. Um, and for somebody to be doing something about these problems, these these failures, is a sort of a good news story. It enables you as a journalist to um, communicate uh, to people that there is hope, that they have some agency, that things can get better. It's not just another, my God, how screwed are we story. Yeah. Um, you know, I should say for international um yes listeners um i don't know if any of you have seen i, I kind of recommended actually um steven soderberg made two films um i think in the 90s called um uh imaginatively che one and che two and che one is about um how the revolution in cuba succeeded and che two is about how the revolution in bolivia involving exactly the same people failed and the kind of message that I take from those two stories is um, every country, every situation, every context is different. So um, how good a project operates successfully in the United Kingdom doesn't automatically translate to other countries like the United States that does have a higher law and a written constitution. But it seems to work, our model in the UK. Yeah. Um, no, no. And um, just picking up on that, do you see other places in the world where there's sort of pockets of great practice? Um, a good law, I guess, that holding power to account, and and obviously in different contexts, whether that's on environmental things or, or the minorities in particular. Um, I mean, it's uh, it's difficult for me to answer that question with the accuracy I would want because I don't live in those other countries. Um, I mean, I grew up in New Zealand, and I am proud of the progress that New Zealand has made um, when it comes to tackling disadvantage amongst the, the Maori community. I mean, one of the one of the weirdest and, and, and bizarrely most pleasurable moments of my, my life was talking about how um, uh, the um, revitalization of Te Reo Maori, the, the, the Maori language in New Zealand, had led to a kind of cultural renaissance for Maori culture. And I was speaking about this in the context of a debate that was happening in Cardiff about whether the parliament building in Cardiff should be called the Senate, um, the, the, the Welsh word for, for, for parliament, or um, Welsh parliament slash Senate. And I said that, you know, if in a country called, if in Wales, um, uh, it was too much to ask the population to call um, the parliament um, the Senate, then we were in a very, very bad way. And that led to an invitation for me to go and speak in front of the Senate from the Welsh Language Society, uh, a speech I delivered um, half in Cumbria say. and half in English. Um, Fantastic. Uh, did you learn it by, off by heart, presumably that yeah, half? Yeah, I, I learned. So I was met by um, someone from Clyde Cymru off the train um, at Cardiff train station. We spent an hour in a, uh, a cafe, um, him giving me the Welsh translation of the sentences I wanted to utter uh, and teaching me how to say them properly. Um, it was um, hilarious and I really, <laughs> I really loved it. Was it, it recorded? We now want to see. <laughs> there will be a recording floating around somewhere. Um, God forbid it ever emerges. <laughs> the speech actually is on, is on my old tax blog, um, uh, waitingfortax.com. Yeah. Um, it was a good speech. Uh, it would have been better if I'd 
not try to deliver it. Not to try to do it. No, it, I think I do think it's respectful. I I um a couple of years ago saw the Rolling Stones in Copenhagen, and Mick Jagger came on stage and spoke sort of Danish for about ten minutes. Wow! Uh, and it was so impressive, and of course it um the the crowds loved him for it. Um, just making an effort. Um, yeah, was brilliant. Um, on on the global thing, um. It's really clear from the book that you know politics and law can't be untangled. Um, do you think that's just a global truth? And let's put us the US aside because that's that's a whole different business. But it, it, is that just in general? Um, yeah, it is. I think it is a global truth. Yeah. I think I can say that with some with some confidence. So. Um, I mean, there are lots and lots of examples. This is kind of really is a central theme of the of the book. Um, you know, the judicial oath is to judge without fear or favour, but judges don't do it and no one thinks they do, but we never talk about the fact yeah. that they don't do it or no one ever thinks they do. If you ever I'm... suggest that they're, they're, they're politically influenced, um, you know, the, it's like the sky has fallen in um, for a lawyer to say it. But, but, but privately, we all know it to be true and we all tell it uh, as truth and how do how do you think um because you, you you know you talk about that and i think you make some great points around exactly of course they're influenced by their own biases by the context they're operating in and so on what's the level of scrutiny because that's the other thing that then they're not you know there isn't that scrutiny is there a way of doing that or is that because and i'm going to reference the book so you have to go and read it everyone that there is this concept of sort of good chaps and everybody is is, is doing the best is yeah, I mean, so uh, in the book, I argue that um, in the book, I argue that we really ought to be doing for judges um, what we ask employers to do. So employers um, have to produce big employers at any rate, have to produce equal pay data at the end of every year mm -hmm. and they have to produce equal pay data um, so that um, they can be scrutinized externally, but also um, so that they can understand, they can ask themselves the question, um, why do these imbalances, these gender imbalances exist? And there's no real reason why we shouldn't do the same with judges. There's no real reason why um, we shouldn't look at discrepancies um, when it comes to outcome um, as between different judges. So every barrister knows, you know, the first question you ask when you see um, what judge you've been given for a particular case is, um, are they a good draw or a bad draw for me? Mm -hmm. Are they going to be favourable or, or disfavourable to my case? Um, and, you know, if you're in a small bit of the legal profession, you'll already know the answer to that question. If you're in a bigger bit, you might have to ask your colleagues. But everyone wants to know, and they don't want to know idly. They want to know because they know very well that it, it affects um, their prospects of succeeding. But but there's no visibility of that. And, you know, there was an occasion in which um, I said to um, those who had crowdfunded us of a particular judge um, that he um, was known to be very, very government minded. And so we were likely to lose. Um, and that was indeed what our very grand lawyers had told me as soon as we found out who the judge was. And indeed, because I litigate quite a lot in that field, I knew it anyway. Right. So there was information that I knew that was communicated to me that would have been communicated to me, even if I was not a barrister, but just a normal lay client. But the notion that I should share that outside of the, 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 the church um, drew outrage on, 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 on Twitter, although no one was able quite to articulate um, why that was a, a bad thing. And I think, um, and, and in the book I talk about, um, I borrow a phrase from the Sutton Trust, actually. Um, they talk about, I think, the corridor of privilege that judges and senior civil servants walk along together. So judges and senior civil servants are the sort of group, the two groups most likely to be privately educated and then go to Oxbridge. So they will have grown up with one another. They will know, very likely know one another. And if they won't, if they don't know one another, they'll um, 
be one degree of separation from one another and they'll know one another's type and they'll believe exactly. they will understand what one another will do. And so they're very, very complacent um, about the possibility of, uh, judges are very complacent about the possibility of their peers doing things that are, are wrong because they think they know what their peers will do. And, um, you know, all of Good Law Project was very, very heavily involved in um, bringing to life, um, to light, I should say, those appalling stories about sleaze and corruption during PP procurement during yeah. the COVID pandemic. Um, and if um, that happened anywhere else in the world, we would have called them what they were, um, corruption. Um, and if judges had been confronted with them happening anywhere else in the world, judges would have been um, ready to do what the evidence suggested that they should. But um, in England, uh, our media wasn't. We still live in a sort of um, kind of prelapsarian world in which England is a country where bad things, where, 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 there is no, where there is no sin, if you like. And so whatever the evidence suggests um, about wrongdoing and how compelling that evidence is, we will shy away from drawing the conclusion that the evidence points to because it would involve us um, as judges saying that um, a really, really bad thing has has happened in, in the Garden of Eden, the sort of moral Garden of Eden. Um, and... Um, I mean, I suspect we never lived in that prelapsarian world. Um, I suspect that account um, that many of us, I think, um, would naturally give of a sort of pre and post 2016 Britain or a pre and post 2012 Britain. I mean, 2012, a, a date um, that sort of my, my tribe um thinks of as being associated with the London Olympics, a sort of great celebration of um of 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 pluralism of a country that I was very, very proud of. I suspect that pre and post lapsarian world never never existed. Um yes. but 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 certainly um the world that Peter Hennessy described where good chaps would ensure that bad things didn't happen, politicians weren't able to do bad things, um, uh, disappeared with, with Dominic Cummings. Um, oh. And I think there is a sort of growing sense that that world has gone, that we're not going to get it back, um, that institutions um, are struggling. Um, by institutions, I suppose I mean what you might broadly describe as as as, as public regulators um, have become politicized, are ill-equipped to to exist in in the new world. And um, you, so you use um you use Twitter quite frequently and have been quite open and quite brave on um criticizing judges and sort of and 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 saying what maybe needs to be said more publicly. Do you think that as um as we've lost that world i guess post cummings or um is is twitter and social media a tool that could do more for, for the good side i guess to to keep that account or, or is it just noise um i mean it's very important to me um and it is a place where um opinions are formed um but I don't think it has universal cut through in all sectors. It's much more influence, much more influential on politics mm. uh, and the media than I think it is um, in the law. Um, I do. Um, I mean, I. It's a very dangerous narrative for Good Law Project, actually. This narrative that that judges are. Um, um, are not acting consistently with their oath to judge without fear or favour. Because the book says very explicitly that judges are fearful, gives some examples of judges saying that themselves. Um, uh, 
and that's a narrative that's unlikely to endear me um, to judges. Um, although, you know, like every institution, the judiciary is not a not a monolith. Um, so, I mean, I try and cushion it by saying that judges are being bullied mm. rather than saying um, judges are, you're, you're, are I think acting you're being quite like kind to judges. Them. I think you're being quite kind to them, actually, when sort of taking the whole book. Um, it, it doesn't f feel at any point, at least in my mind, to, as an attack on judges and that they're not doing their jobs, but it's really clear that, that there is that pressure. And, um, that's, that's a great triumph of messaging, Louise. I'm, I'm very, very pleased to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I thought it was really well balanced, actually. Um, so, oh, suddenly we've got some more. Um, oh, John. Okay, I'm going to pick a silly question from John. Oh, I'm going to call it silly. Is TV's Judge, Judge John Deed com um, complete and utter fiction, or is there more to it? I mean, it's a splendid fiction, isn't it? Um uh I loved Judge John Deed as well. Was it Martin Shaw? Yeah, I'm trying yeah, to remember was, that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um and um his very beautiful colleague that I remember my dad fancied a lot. Um <laughs> I, certainly my experience of practicing the law um uh, uh now and then bore little relationship to to Judge John Deed. So was it okay. John who asked that question? Yes. John, yeah. you do not need to um, regret that you wasted your life um, not being uh, a king's counsel and then a judge. It, it isn't as much fun as it looks um, from the telly. Well, um, Louise, if I could just very quickly, I sat in on the criminal court about two weeks ago and watched this Croydon tram driver, the part of that trial, and I have to say, the proceedings were so tedious, I wouldn't have needed a sleeping draft. So, I mean, I, it, it, my tongue was in my cheek when I asked the question. More um, representative, I'm afraid, than Judge John Deed. Ah, uh, so so just following up on with a, on on our, our previous sort of conversation. So, how optimistic are you feeling about the potential for UK politics to sort of change and then change that context for, for the law for the better, presumably following the next general election? Do you, are you going to have fewer reasons to litigate against the next government, do you think? Um, uh, I mean, obviously, there are challenges for Good Law Project when, as increasingly seems to be true, there is a change in government. Um, I'm pretty sure we'll have a lot to do. It's um, a very, very small C Conservative Labour Party. And I have lots and lots of friends in the Labour Party, at the heart of the Labour Party, and none of them are saying that there is a sort of secret drawer of radical ideas um, that Labour is going to implement um, if it wins the, the general election. I'm, I'm pretty sure there'll be quite a lot to do. I think I think Starmer is enjoying the thought of getting behind the wheel of this enormously powerful vehicle um, that the Conservative Party has built oh. for the, the executive. Um, um, they will be a lot better on, on on climate change, though. Good, and hopefully also on sort of corruption. Let's call it what it is. Um, the there's, there's, they'll, they'll have a lot of fun <laughs> going through those COVID contracts, I think, and oh. reminding everyone why they must never again vote Conservative. Yeah, well, well I, I think the younger generations definitely won't, at least the ones I know. Um, Greg was very good. Thank you, Greg. He emailed me beforehand to for, with a, quite a specific question because he knows that sometimes I get carried away. So let me just read it out. So how can legal action transform the impact of regulation that are not enforced by government? For example, as many as 70% of large UK companies fail to comply with their statutory payment practice reporting obligations. And those that do around 25% of their payments breach contractual payment terms. Enforcement would transform the funding um, of SMEs, which are responsible for 63% of UK business emissions, CO2 emissions, I'm assuming, and the ability to invest in net zero. Um, also, is this something which the Good Law Project should and could help with? Um. So, um, I mean, this really is the point that I was making earlier about um, 
how the law um, at a substantive level represents the victory dance of power, but also at a procedural level um, is useless unless, or not much better than useless, unless exercised. Um, mm. uh, I suspect the reason why the late payment regs aren't enforced um, as often as they might be is because they represent, I mean, suing someone um, might get you your money, but it tends to destroy the relationship that you have with your um, with your customer. Um, I mean, it's a very, very easy claim to bring. And, um, uh, you know, it's a piece of work um, that's not, presently core to us but 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 we could we could we could pick up um Greg just lead that crowdfunding right <laughs> it's not very difficult right to put up uh some pro forma uh, uh advice and um a sort of um fill in the blanks set of pleadings um that uh, anyone could do if they wanted to sue. Um, so it wouldn't be a difficult thing to do, um, but but it does rely on you being prepared to to sue a, a, an important customer. Thank you. And just on that, sort of on what you choose to do or not. So you've got Brexit cases, there's many more sort of the government lies and corruption you've got big tech companies like uber and meta so in case you didn't know that um uh, you've got cases around uh, trans and sexual assault you've got you know what are your criteria there are quite a lot of goliaths there um and there are. I, I, yeah exactly and i was uh, and obviously you've got three categories i was thinking a couple of things one was are there any really large successful companies that are, I'm going to say good or behave well? Um, and it does this thing, so we're a B corporation incubated the movement in the UK, um, you know, uh, and, and it requires that you put in your, in your articles that you're going to look after more than just the shareholders and, and look at communities, employers, employees, and so on and so forth. Um, is that a, a way of safeguarding it um or the better business act that's proposed you know will these things have an effect do, do, are they needed or should we really yeah. be suing large companies at this point i i think um i mean i like very much um uh stop funding hates model um stop funding hate um goes up after um companies that advertise in newspapers that have been criticized by the united nations for promulgating hate speech um mm. and i think there is a really important project um uh consumer facing project to be done to improve the functioning of of um of big important consumer facing businesses in particular in the uk i mean um uh, some of that happens already. Um, so yesterday I tweeted about um, Just Up Oil protesters um, going to Canary Wharf to protest outside uh, Total's offices, um, Total Energy's offices for um, this big new oil pipeline in Africa. So, you know, obviously there is some consumer facing, there is some consumer pressure already. There, of course, you know, there's no... Um, silver bullet that's going to solve um that's going to improve business behavior um i i do think um that there is space for more um there is space for organizations to do more bringing consumer pressure to bear so as i say i do like the um just stop hate um mm -hmm. stop funding hate model and i think there's a sort of a, there's an equivalent stop funding oil model that i'd really really like to pick up um if we had um if we had support for, for for doing that um and you know there was a place for legislation as well um if you think there's no silver bullet then then you know you're always looking for um new mechanics um through which to um 
focus public discontent with 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 corporate misbehavior i mean funnily enough i was very closely involved with ed Miliband's 2015 campaign yes. uh, and right at the heart of his campaign was was a message about um good and bad capitalism which felt quite radical then and feels quite um conservative now um maybe it's time um will come um I want to pick up on this because um, one of the things I noted, you know, you talk about generating, I think, um, I think the sentence is you're generating legal and reputational risk for HMRC in the Uber case. And that really sort of jumped out at me because you are, it, it seems clearly not just deploying the law, but also media and also basically any other tactics to rebalance that political pressure on institutions in order to get them to, to do what is right or what's just. Um, is there any, or are there any tactics you have not yet deployed that is, are up your sleeve or you, that you can see new things coming? And and the second one was, are you really, and, and I know you, you say in the book that there was talk about you um, joining, um, officially joining um, Labour, in, in different positions had they won the 2015 um, election. Are you really a politician rather than a campaigning lawyer? Um, you know, and you're using everything to, 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 to really have that impact. Yeah, so the legal and reputational risk um, point first. Um, you know, if you think the law isn't that powerful, then fundamentally, the influence you can wield by bringing um, strategic litigation is uh, legal risk, but also reputational risk. And it is that combination of um, of cases that um, are legally compelling, but are also um, politically salient that are um, those cases that Good Law Project chooses. That that that's the that's the bit that we're looking for within those themes. They have to be um, salient as well as legally sensible, um, because very often it is um, the, the the reputational damage that um, the defendants fear more than the, the the legal damage. I mean, we've known about this phrase, government um, in perpetual campaigning mode. I think that was first used in the states in the in, in the 80s, yeah. I think. And if you're a government in perpetual campaigning mode, the only language you speak is the language of political pain. So if you want to influence that government, you can't speak to it in terms of what good policy looks like. You have to speak to it in terms of what um, uh, acting or inacting will do for its electoral prospects. Um, and so that is uh, the language of, of reputational risk. It's true of governance, and I also think it's true of consumer-facing businesses. I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, just a, reframing then a question we talked about just earlier, do you think that the, if we assume that there's going to be a Labour government of some kind, whether it's um, minority or, or majority next time in the UK, do you think they will be less of a campaigning government? Um I think it's um, too early to say. Um, it is a government that's very, very fearful of um, of the press. So it is mm -hmm. a government that's much more than I'm comfortable with. Sorry, a, a government in waiting that's much more than I'm comfortable with willing to do the bidding of, um, of the Murdoch press. I mean, one of the most depressing moments uh, uh, of the last year or so was seeing um, it reported that um, Keir Starmer was going to Rupert Murdoch's parties and I thought to myself what change can we can, 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 can we hope for um, uh, so I think it's going to be very very politically conservative um, and that I suppose creates the opportunity for, for new types of reputational risk I mean it's interesting to me that as a sort of aggressive left-wing commentator that's about holding power to account um mm. we might be very influential indeed because the right-wing press that hates us at the moment that attacks us very vigorously um, might be very very keen to carry our messages because they will be very very damaging will be the right message carrier to attack 
um, a Labour Party, and you know we'll have to think very carefully about how we how we play those 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 cards. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because it feels like the the, the maybe the, you know maybe it's not just a one off with this this current government, but that a shift has happened where where governments are more fearful. It, it partly the sort of the whole um, sort of polling. Oh, people think this, so we let's go and campaign in that direction. And maybe it is a shift in in politics in general. As, yeah. I mean, you have to assume, don't you, that politicians um, act on the basis of very, very good polling data, mm -hmm. um, are surrounded by very, very clever people, cleverer than those who write columns about politicians in newspapers. I think it's foolish not to make those assumptions. You right. know, you have, it's sensible to assume they do know what they're doing. Um, but I also um, think that um, an age of professional politicians has created politicians who lack you know what um is it John O'Keefe's called animal spirits yeah who, who won't um ever take a a risk on things who don't really have a thing that they go into politics wanting who lack um all conviction um I think that's very much Starmer's problem and it was, you know, it was Johnson's great um, gift um, yes. that, that he was at least able to sell um, the appearance of conviction. He gave a very interesting interview um, to those who are who are interested in the sort of the the, the Johnson legacy to Tom Mc Tom McTague at the Atlantic. It was kind of widely criticised as a, um, you know, as a hagiography of Johnson. But it but it's very very interesting. He talks oh, um, okay. Johnson about uh, what it means to, to 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 speak to people, what it means to communicate with people. Well worth well worth reading. Oh, um, quite... The other question you asked me was, "Am I really a politician?" And the answer to that is, um, um, "Yes." I mean, I am <laughs> very much about. Um, I, I'm never going to stand for office, um, but but my interests are fundamentally a political interests. Um, and I advance them using the law um, and campaigning. But I think this notion that the law is um, not a political tool doesn't really bear even the slightest examination. Um, nobody complains uh, when the Christian uh, legal centre brings cases seeking to put an end to abortion um in the uk no one says that's a political misuse of the law it's mm. um when criticism is made of us it's really just a way of um dignifying um the call by power that we stop i i think every everyone who uses the law is political because the law is is, is political as i say it represents the political preferences of the government from time to time and when you use it, you're you're advancing those political preferences. Brilliant. Um, I'm going to go to a few sort of not quite quick fire, but questions so we could, to make sure we get through all of them. Um, and Tina has asked, what other tools do you think there are to persuade people to speak the quiet parts out loud to break open the mutually agreed upon parameters of the special relationships within those corridors of privilege? So Gosh. To that idea of the the corridors of privilege. What yeah, happened? well, I I try and talk about this in the book. I think um, lots of senior lawyers, lots of senior civil servants know that what's happening around them is 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 wrong, is bad, doesn't um, align with um, their personal values, doesn't align with the sort of um, professional codes to which they notionally adhere. Um, but the book also talks about the fact that um, cracking open those realities involves sacrifice, right? You can't um, expect to change power without it costing. Um, and it's not for me to tell people what sacrifices they should make. That's a sort of personal assessment for everyone and everyone's situation will be different. Shay one and Shay two again. Um, but um, the notion that change costs 
that influence costs um, is certainly, um, I think, true and universal and should be our starting point. You know, I'd even turn that formulation on its head and say that if it isn't costing you, it's probably not change or probably not good change. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Yeah. So, so I, th I think I think that notion is 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 really really important as well. There's a line in the book which I, I'll just I mean let's 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 keep talking. I'll see if I can find that 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 line as we chat. Oh, um, is it the line about sacrifice? Um, yes, yeah, the the writer um, who uh, wrote a very famous book after it surviving a concentration camp. Um, um I, yeah, so I, I had a question actually related directly to it. It, it was almost that you can't have an impact, is how I read it, is not the quote, um, without sacrificing something that you want. And, um, you know, do you, is there always pain associated with ha being that change agent or, uh, or or sacrifice or give up, giving up something in order to? I think, I think. I think there is actually, I think there really is. Um, uh, certainly that's very true for me. Um, uh, very often it's trauma that motivates these rather odd choices that people make um, to throw themselves full bodily into um, yeah. being an agent of change. So, um, you know, there is uh, Obama's line about Biden that he turned pain into purpose. And the book begins with a with a quote from um, Bell Hooks. She says, yeah. "What we allow the mark of our suffering to become is in our own hands." So um, very often, that desire to sacrifice comes from um, from from pain, from 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 pathology. But also, um, the image that really resonates for me is is um, is. Uh, Gandalf standing on the bridge of Khazad-dûm, for those of you who remember Lord of the Rings, and this fiery Balrog approaches him, uh, and you and the sort of camera sort of zooms in on 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 his eyes, and you can see the fear. He knows this thing is too much for him, um, but he stands there anyway because it's what he has to do. Um, and for me, at a sort of pretty deeply personal level, I don't really care. Um, what impact I have. I don't judge um, the sort of quality of my actions by reference to what I achieve because that, that's kind of out of my control. I judge the quality of my actions by reference to what I'm prepared to do, what I'm prepared to, to risk, um, whether I've done my best. Those are things that are within my, my, my sphere of control. They do involve sacrifice, but that sacrifice is also rewarding because I... Um, feel that I've done what I can to make the world a better place yeah and I feel like that there are two sort of linking in and again I'm coming back to your book the you know the the quote on to live an unhappy life is a tragedy so don't um and then very closely linked to that this idea that a happy life does mean a life of agency um and maybe that's activism for some of us um in different forms I, th I think that's really quite powerful yeah. So, I mean, take back control um, was a slogan that spoke to those who felt that in a globalized world, they'd lost any ability to influence their lives. And the problem with not having agency um, is that it makes you feel unhappy and feeling unhappy is a, 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 because things are done to you. You can't influence your life at all. Um, that makes you unhappy. And that unhappiness is a tragedy. It's a waste of a life. Um, but from an activism, from a sort of societal perspective, um, that unhappiness also causes you to turn away from trying to make things better. It, 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 it causes you to feel disempowered. And in fact, the um, flywheel that you want to get spinning is a flywheel, is the flywheel that begins with people feeling as though they can make things better, they can make change happen. Um, and they start small and they see some change and that inspires them and then they inspire other people around them. I mean, that's the story that I try to tell in the book. So I think those notions of agency and, and, and happiness and preparedness to make sacrifice are all quite closely interlinked.
Good. I'm, I've, I'm, I'm taking too long. I can tell. Um, so we've got six minutes. So is it going to, there's a couple of questions and I've got a final one. I just want to ask you. So Shasi is asking your opinion on the international court of justice, both in terms of international politics and global sense of justice or sense of global justice. Obviously that's a very, very big question. So, so, um, I mean, it's not never that the international courts are useful, but it is very, very rarely because um, without a means by which to enforce um, its will, um, the law doesn't really do a great deal. And international agencies have very, very limited means by which to enforce their will. So, you know, we might well find Putin a war criminal uh, if that happened tomorrow. What would it change? Would it change the course of war in Ukraine? I don't think so. Um, so it's not that it never has any impact, but but I don't myself see international law as being particularly powerful. Neither, of course, does the British government see that line about breaking international law like it's one of our five, five a day. Okay. And so following that, the um, Committee for Climate Change here in the UK set up to a whole parliament to account, and yet no enforcement. And we, again, it's a theme we've come back to a couple of times, sort of no legal powers to get the government to deliver net zero um yeah so but it speaks the language of political pain doesn't it or at least that was the that was the predicate the predicate was that government would would care um what the um climate change committee said um but government only cares what the climate change committee says um, if the media attaches cost to it ignoring um, the environmental agenda, um, because otherwise the bad things that the Climate Change Committee says that the government is doing are never um, before um, the electorate. And so the government in perpetual campaigning mode can safely ignore them. I mean, that's, uh, I'm afraid, a rather trite way of putting it, but um, we only have three minutes left. Yeah, exactly. No, thank you. Um, the I've got so Joe has asked something, that, and then I've, I've got a follow up to that. I guess what should primary age children understand about the law? I love that question, Joe. Thank you. Yeah, that is a very, a very, a very good question. Um, I think, I think it, it's a, it's um. It's something about um, its relationship to, to morality, um, uh, about the law representing what society thinks is, 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 is right. Um, I think that relationship between the law and, and ethics um, is something that we might come to first. Um, as 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 new new human beings uh, as primary primary age children. Um, Maybe it's the law in in context rather than I telling think that's right. justice. Um, something like that. Um, and then with the very so still keeping on the theme of young people, I guess. And um, we've got a couple of our young um, work experience students on the call. I think Annika and Cecily. And um, and would you? So there's a couple of things. So one, we've got AI coming up, which we haven't even touched on, which is also quite interesting. But would you recommend young people going into to law? Um, as, yeah, as... so I get a lot of um, questions Hello. from from young lawyers uh, saying um, the world is burning and I'm about to go and start my training contract at a huge international law firm yes. um, where I'll be, you know, <laughs> doing private equity deals for the next five years? Am I wasting my life? Mm. And I think, um, you know, the law is a very, very powerful tool, a very, very powerful weapon. And the the, the advice I always give, and I, I think it's good advice is, go and get that training, do become a lawyer. It's a very, very powerful tool. Um, don't allow your expenses um, to grow as your income grows. Make sure that you have lots of friends who are English teachers um, yeah. or nurses. And then you won't feel trapped. Um, you'll be able to give up that um, very lucrative practice um, to use the law for the things um, that you presently care about. Uh, there are lots and lots of lawyers who are 
you know, 50, very, very wealthy who hate their lives, but see no way out. And they don't see any way out because um, they've allowed their lifestyle to, to match their income. But in fact, you know, spending more money doesn't actually make us that much happier. Um, and if we um, remember um, what we wanted to be when we were younger, um, those uh, that lifestyle isn't that difficult to give up. That's it. So, so do become a lawyer. It's a good, a good practice, good training, powerful tool. Don't allow your expenses to grow. Great advice. Um, we're out of time. <laughs> um, I haven't quite got through everything I wanted to say, but thank you so much um joe that Hopefully was my course i'm afraid i i gave very long answers no 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 there, there was lots of questions so 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 that was fine i can see lucy's thing thank you that it was interesting and incredible thank you lucy um thank you everyone normally we then yeah oh, we've got some clapping but we normally allow people to unmute and say goodbye and thank you if they would like just as we sort of wave off um we will send you the chat um so you can see it if you haven't had a chance to look at it throughout because you've been chatting oh, away thank you very much everyone i'm really touched by those by those messages um i can see all of your faces uh, incredibly engaged audience such great questions um and uh, i'm sorry i mean an hour and a half is usually far too long but i now feel a bit sorry <laughs> that we haven't got lost thank no, you no, it was great and hopefully we can um Yes. As we gear up, I think at least our team is gearing up for more in-person things. So maybe we can lure you across um, for, for those of you who, who can, can reach London. So thank you all. Good night. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Cheers. Bye.